welcome back for another Sheriff of Sodium video, Resident Unionization, Part 1, Lessons from Hamburger University. I want you all to think back to the year 2020. I'm sure you remember it well. It was a tough year for people in healthcare. Um, you know, if you were a frontline provider, you were worried about taking care of your patients with this new and scary disease and keeping yourself safe when we had shortages of personal protective equipment. And if you were in a specialty that wasn't on the front lines, you may have faced some financial hardship as elective surgeries and procedures were shut down and patient volumes dropped. 2020 was a tough year. But, um, you know, 2020 turned out to be a pretty good year for HCA. The, uh, the nation's largest for-profit hospital chain. Even amidst the business challenges of the pandemic, HCA managed to book a profit of 3.8 billion. And yeah, I said billion with a B. HCA's CEO, Samuel Hazen, he did pretty well too. He took home $30.4 million in compensation. That was up from 26.8 million in 2019 which means that he got a 13% raise. Not too bad. Now, you could argue that Mr. Hazen deserved such generous compensation. I mean, HCA, they had a hell of a year. And, and for all we know, I mean, maybe Mr. Hazen is the only CEO who had the business insight to lead them to such profits. I mean, maybe the guy's worth his weight in gold. Although if he is at a price of $1,800 an ounce and assuming he's an average sized guy, he still got overpaid by about $25 million. It's fair to point out that Hazen's compensation, enormous as it is, is just a drop in the bucket for HCA. In fact, that $30.4 million represents less than 1%, actually 0.8% of HCA's corporate profits. But it's also fair to point out that $30.4 million is still a lot of money. In fact, it's 556 times what the average worker at HCA earned in 2020. And HCA isn't just the country's biggest hospital chain. It's also the single biggest sponsor of residency positions in this country. And, uh, you know, although I'm certain that Mr. Hazen did a bang up job as CEO in 2020, I'm equally certain that HCA couldn't have turned such a tidy profit without the labor of its over 5,100 residents and fellows. And if instead the HCA board had chosen to allocate that $30.4 million to its resident physicians, which again is a sum that reflects just 0.8% of the company's total profit, well, then each resident would have gotten a $6,000 raise. And although I'll concede that $6,000 isn't a ton of money, I'll bet a $500 per month raise is more life-changing for the average resident than the $3.6 million raise that Hazen received. So why are things this way? Why shouldn't the CEO's pay be cut and the resident's pay increased? Look, I hear residents make this argument all the time. And when you frame it this way, the fact that the hospital's CEO earns 500 times as much as the hospital's interns, well, it seems grossly unfair. Because folks, I guarantee the CEO ain't working 500 times harder than the intern is. But the problem with this argument is that it relies on the listener's sense of justice to be persuasive. And that may work on a preschooler who's dividing up the afternoon snack. You tell them it's not fair to, to take 500 cookies when your classmates only get one. But unfortunately, that kind of justice-based argument is highly unlikely to persuade the executives whose salaries would be cut or the business-minded boards that employ them. If you want an argument that's going to resonate with business people who spend their days focused on dollars and cents, you can't present that argument in the language of justice or fairness. It's got to be presented in the language of economics, and it's got to be convincing. This is Chris Kempzenski, the CEO of McDonald's. He had a pretty good year in 2022. Now, he didn't do quite as well as Samuel Hazen. Kempzenski pocketed a mere $20 million in compensation but um, still reflects a sum that's over 2,250 times more than the average McDonald's worker. And look, I'm sure Ken Sinsky is a real hard working, pull yourself up by the bootstraps kind of guy, but uh, McDonald's feeds 69 million customers a day at nearly 40,000 stores worldwide. Chris ain't flipping all them burgers himself. 
So just like we said for Hazen, it is beyond dispute to say that Kempsinski couldn't have had such a good year without the hard work of his employees. And yet McDonald's could scarcely pay its workers any less than it already does. The majority of McDonald's workers already earn the local minimum wage, and they had average wages of only $8.69 per hour in 2015. And so again, I ask, if McDonald's workers create such value for the company's executives, well, why don't they earn any more? The answer should be obvious. Working at McDonald's is hard work, but the average worker is easily replaceable. It's basic supply and demand. If you have a high supply of potential workers, the price for each of those workers will fall. There's just no reason to increase wages as long as you've got a steady stream of replacement workers who are willing to work at the present rates. And this, in large part, is the fundamental problem with resident wages. Individual residents are replaceable too. Some people get very offended when I say that. They point out correctly that, uh, that even a July 1st intern is nonetheless a highly skilled professional. And I absolutely agree. These people often go on to point out also correctly that when Congress granted the NRMP a specific antitrust exemption, they robbed future residents of the ability to play potential employers off of each other and thereby negotiate for better pay or more humane hours. Sometimes people say, well, you know, do away with the match and then residents, then they can negotiate for their true value. I don't see it. Get rid of the match if you want, but don't do it because you think residents are suddenly going to make more money. They won't. Look, last year there were 47,675 potential residents who registered for the NRMP match. There were only 36,277 PGY positions available. In other words, there are literally thousands of unmatched applicants who are sitting at home on the couch. There are many thousands more who maybe they matched, but they didn't match in their dream specialty or at their most desired program. So I want you to ask, how many of those folks, if given the opportunity, would eagerly do an existing residence job for 90 cents on the dollar? What about 50 cents on the dollar? How many would do it for free? And the point here is not to come up with an exact number. The point is to understand that each of those numbers is non-zero. At every strata of the residency training pyramid, there is somebody who would like to take the job of the resident who is already in that position. There is no reason from a basic supply and demand perspective that any individual resident could not be easily replaced. The difference between a resident who gets into a program and the next one on the rank order list are small. Ask residency applicants today how intense the competition is. Small differences, a few USMLE points here, AOA or a research paper there, those small differences change career trajectories. So if one applicant demands that they want to have more money or work fewer hours, you think the program's going to negotiate or they're just going to go to the next available person? Yeah, 97% of you answered that question correctly. The law of supply and demand applies to individual resident physicians just as much as anything else. When the supply of a particular good exceeds the demand, prices don't rise. They fall. But here's what's funny. Not all McDonald's employees are poorly paid. A McDonald's worker in Denmark, for instance, gets wages of $22 an hour, along with six weeks paid vacation, life insurance, a year of paid parental leave, paid sick leave, and a pension plan. And all that's on top of a more generous social safety net than we have in the United States. And before you start, no, this is not just a cost of living adjustment for a more expensive area. Most McDonald's workers in New York City still only earn the local minimum wage of $15 an hour, and they get nowhere near these benefits. And it's not because Danish McDonald's workers are any less replaceable than their U.S. counterparts either. The unemployment rate in Denmark is typically slightly higher than in the United States, so in theory there should be no shortage of replacement workers. Instead, 
it's because the Danish workers are the beneficiaries of decades of collective action. See, in 1981, McDonald's opened their first store in Denmark. At that point, McDonald's was already a global powerhouse. They'd grown from a single restaurant in San Bernardino to over 6,000 restaurants in 27 countries. They achieved this near exponential growth in part through extensive standardization. When you go into a McDonald's, you know what you're going to get. And so when McDonald's came to Denmark, they followed all of their standard procedures, including paying very low wages to their workers. This put McDonald's out of step with other employers in the restaurant sector and attracted the attention of union organizers. But uh, McDonald's management asserted that it disagreed on principle, mind you. They disagreed with unionization and they refused to negotiate. Tensions escalated. Here are some pictures from the 80s showing picketing workers carrying signs that appear to show a canine micturating on the Golden Arches. By 1988, the situation reached a tipping point, and Denmark's other labor unions brought McDonald's to its knees. Dock workers refused to unload containers that had McDonald's equipment in them. Printers refused to supply printed materials to their stores, such as menus and cups. Construction workers refused to build McDonald's stores and even stopped construction on a store that was already in progress but not yet complete. The Typographers Union refused to place McDonald's advertisements in publications, which eliminated the company's print advertisement presence. Truckers refused to deliver food and beer to McDonald's. Food and beverage workers that worked at facilities that prepared food for the stores refused to work on McDonald's products. Ultimately, management caved and began to share more of their profits with the workers who helped generate those profits in the first place. There's an important lesson here. The Danish workers didn't win by working individually to convince management about what was fair, what was just. They won by working collectively and making a forceful economic argument. To quote again Matt Brunig, McDonald's doesn't pay Danes high wages because of a statutory wage floor, or even because the state stepped in to enforce a collective bargaining agreement. They pay high wages because back in the 1980s, Danish unions flipped a switch and turned the whole business off. And McDonald's doesn't want to find out whether they'd do it again. The most important lesson is this. Individually, McDonald's workers and resident physicians are replaceable. But collectively, they're not. Now make no mistake, unions are no panacea. There are real limits to what they can accomplish and certain trade-offs that workers who unionize must accept. And if you stick with me in part two, I'll cover some of the history and current status of resident physician unions. Thanks for listening.